All right. Let's get ahead. Let's go go ahead and start the uh the session. How to avoid overcomplicating your data architecture. So first thing, a little bit about me. So I'm Christina Lin. Hi everyone. Um. So I just want to quickly walk through through walk you through some of my previous experience, so you know where I'm coming from. And I started playing play video games for a very long time, but that's way too long. So I started working in the industry a uh, couple decades ago. Um. I know I'm old, but uh, yes, so we, I started working. And then when, when I started working, there's a lot of adoptions in AS400s. So I was doing a lot of um, data. I was doing a lot of data work on Sybase. So that was the, actually the first time uh, we were. I was working in an insurance company and we were working with, uh, I think it was called Tata at the time. I think it is still called Tata today. And they were working with us on creating this huge insurance um, uh, system. Um, where everything was built uh, in with COBOL on the mainframe computers and we're extracting everything out of, of COBOL and put that into our Oracle and Sybase database. And that was the first time I saw a store procedure that was 200 lines long, maybe longer, I'm not sure, um, but it's a lot longer. This is like the first time I saw how people can deal with data in such a uh, precise way of uh, moving data. And there's a lot of there's a lot of temp tables going on in and out of that table thing, right? So that's that's what's going on there. We're using messaging queue, IBM MQ, if you still remembers that thing, um, to get data out of um, the AS400s and we're communicating it through putting it into Oracle or DB2 at the time and providing information uh, through that. And then we slowly move on. So once I, I started my career there and then I moved on to working more in the integration space. I was kind of head of the integration there. I, we were kind of designing things around uh, the, the SOA, I don't know, service-oriented architecture, if you still remember that, but we were doing a lot of like SOA work and we were adopting a lot of like the I, old IBM SOA framework. And I found it's really difficult, not difficult in a way that it's very overcomplicated again. So that's when I started looking into other things like integration technologies, like Camel. So I was really, uh, I was really into Camel. So I've done a lot of projects with integrate, integrating data with Camels and stuff like that. Um, and because Camel talks to a lot of um, data source. So I was working with a lot of like, you know, uh, traditional databases, uh, MySQL, Postgres, um, and then also doing some of the Cassandra thing when it came in. And we, at the time, there was a lot of enterprise integration thing that we need to do. So we also have, I was also doing a lot of like asynchronous uh, communication through um, either BRMQ or ActiveMQ or RevMQ at the time it was all messaging queue. And then and everything kind of like moved into like the data warehouse. So I did a lot of like things on Hadoop and then slowly moving, moving on to um, Spark. And then I decided, okay, I'm, I wanna ask. And then we, uh, I, I was kind of working on moving on my career with uh, Red Hat. So I was doing a lot of Kubernetes stuff, but now I am with Red Panda today because I feel like streaming is going to be a big, is going to be a very a huge part of what data is going to be, especially with the data architecture. And I think for today, what I want to do is, is to share with you on you know what I see, my experiences is uh, when working in the industry for, for such a long time. I wanna share with you with some of my findings, some of my observations and my recommendations. Uh, I'm not saying I'm 100% right. I really want to hear your feedback on my thoughts of how data architecture should look like, um, at least for the next uh, couple of years, right? So I would love to hear your feedback. Anything, any comments, I would love to hear them. So let me know. But I want to talk about what I see and what I've been working with uh, from the beginning, um, working with a lot of uh uh, financial institutions mostly because I do a lot of consulting for them and I do a lot of work with them. So this is the reality I see like in those companies where they would have a really legacy system that's doing a lot of the core work. They're trying to move out from this like really core system, but it's really difficult sometimes they say, don't, if it doesn't break, don't, don't fix it. That kind of mentality. A lot of people still has that. So they would have a mainframe running somewhere in their environment and then um, after a couple of years, they slow moving on to the uh, the monolithic application uh, development where they 
have large application servers running a huge package of software that is providing services and they're slowly moving their things out of the mainframe or you know adding more services on top of what they're providing and and they're those those uh those monolithic applications will be um, accessing a lot of like the traditional RDBMS, relational databases, right? Like Oracle, MySQL and all that. So they would have that. And the main way of communication would be using SOAP or REST, depending on the era they were implemented. And also after that, there's a huge jump into the big data era after the, uh, the SOA uh, services was adopted because people finding now they have a lot of data they wanted to kind of reuse them they want to kind of uh, mining the gold because they don't go gold of course um, to get it out of the system and trying to find meanings for them trying to make better precise business decisions on top of it so people were using Hadoop but just because of the sheer amount of data they were putting into that um that um, data store, they need to find a way to kind of make it easy for people to run and calculate the databases. So that's when they will probably introduce things like MapReduce and all that kind of stuff um, to make it faster to calculate things. And because it, the way that to set it up is kind of difficult, so we kind of figure out different things on top of it to run like Hive, um, maybe later on that have Spark to do it. Um, and then once, once um, they have that running, so this will be mostly isolated in one single, uh, in one single uh, department where they're doing a lot of like business and analysis, this information probably didn't probably send out somewhere. They were just mainly generating reports and providing that to um, those kind of like business, more business decisions and stuff like that to help them to make, um, uh, to kind of better their workflows and all that, all that kind of stuff. And then they switch on to the next era, which is event-driven architecture. So that was and really event-driven architecture was there for a long time. Like I think even so I was a little bit of event-driven, but um, I saw people when I was in, when I was in Red Hat, I was, I was seeing a lot of people adopting the microservices thing because of the new Kubernetes platform where people are starting to say, hey, I have all these different type of like applications. I want to handle them independently. I don't want them to be coupled. I want them to be easier to deploy all that kind of stuff. So people are starting to use a lot of like microservices. And, and then also because of that, they're much more free. There's a lot more freedom of using the data stores, right? The data stores can be a little bit uh, free and then it's easier and they want it. And because of the nature of the platform itself, um, it's easier to apply. Uh, it's it, it seems natural to adopt a, a more horizontal scalable data store. So that's when the NoSQL database or the key value stores becomes really popular for these kind of type of services. Um, so that's when we see them coming around. And also because of the adoptions of um, the edge devices, you know, the all like maybe five or six years ago about the IoT craze, like everybody's starting to collect all this data coming in to the, the uh, coming into the into the company, um, data warehouse is no longer where they want to store the data because it needs to be structured. And some of the data that they want to keep from these devices weren't that structured. And some of them were like stream data and stuff like that. And that wasn't the things that they want to put into their warehouse and they don't have the capacity to to process that and put that into their data warehouse. So they were looking into like um, things like data lakes to kind of quickly store things on the cloud. Also another movement that I saw was kind of going into the cloud because just because of how difficult and uh, how complicated to maintain a cluster of data warehouse internally, because there's a lot of like layers of technologies on top. So that's why like people were like using a lot of like cloud services and that. And then, um, and then like a couple of, uh, a couple of years later, I see people starting to like LinkedIn started the Kafka thing where everybody loved the way that it can now handle a lot more capacity for the traffic, especially for the ingestion part. Um, so it enables the data to flow in, inside the comp uh, inside your companies and stuff to a lot faster. And then the the crazy AI thing everybody talks about today. Like if I don't talk about AI today, I feel like I'm left out, you know? Um, and then that happens to a lot of the companies out there as well. They want to reuse the data they, they're, they're, they're collecting and they want to put that into uh, machine learnings and then eventually adopt into the AI space. So that's kind of where, and then you see this progression um, still exist in the company. A lot of a company today, they're still there and they're kind of just slowly building things up um, a little bit of different difference between these are the different communication protocols that they're using and the capacities that they can handle right and if you want to move the data 
um, in and out from the the these uh, system that you build throughout the errors. Uh, you gotta you gotta have to kind of like figure out different ways to move the data, and then like a lot of them relies on a lot of the batch services underneath the hood, and for real time access, you have HTTPs. Um, like uh, and HTTP is a good protocol, but the problem with HTTP is that it's request and response nature making it slow. Uh, so probably not ideal for a lot of like one way or fast feeding com um, data communication for that. So Kafka seems to be um, holding a lot more load today, and that is kind of what I see in the reality. Kind of just and then like you can see that all these are adopting different places still there, and just a quick note on the top, like telling people, hey, I've seen this through, through a lot of, uh, especially like in the, in the insurance um, industry where I, I used to work a lot in. Uh, so like you can see that they have the core, they have different, you know, services like loan claim and all that working in um, their legacy services and they're adopting VIs and they're adopting like new, you know, app, like app related functionalities throughout the days. And, you know, that's kind of like, just give you a like, quick reference of what they are. Because I know it's really hard to kind of see what, what they are. Because I like to give a reference for that. So, okay. So, what are the challenges when we have that kind of um, facilities and, you know, things like that running in the company? Well, the first thing is data silos, right? You know, because just because of when they are are created, when the, when the data are created, uh, where they reside in the different departments, um, people just find they are... are inside a particular space and it's really hard to get them out. So th there's a lot of time we have to duplicate way of collecting data and store them, duplicate in different spaces just because we need them somewhere, right? So that's a lot of data silos that people see, and especially with the legacy systems that it's really easy. It's very hard to face them out. So they're still there. You still need to connect to, to them and stuff like that. And also another challenge is, is because of the regulations and compliances. I, I think that's a that's mostly afterthought, um, just because of the booming data infrastructure, the, the booming data systems that we have today, regulations are catching up. So I found a lot of the um, the clients that I work with or some of the people that I work with are struggling to kind of fit that into their system. Sometimes they have to do that after they have think that they have implemented a particular data structure or data architecture and to have that as a last piece so you gotta find a way to kind of work around it so like that is that is causing a lot of issues and problems um in and that's a big challenges for them and another one that i saw that was kind of talked about a lot um, for the last two or three years is the open, open data initiatives that, be, that API started all that. So people wanted to wait to quickly um, collect data, but also sharing the data out. And what is the best way? What's the fastest way? What's the safest way with the regulations to provide the right data to the external vendors out there, right? So that's kind of another thing that people were struggling or that have a challenges with like finding out the thing. And another one is the, the data overload, right? Um, because we're now having a lot more data coming in and out of our system. And we have trouble kind of making, uh, finding where to put them. Should we delete them? Should we store them? Or where should we put them? Should we process them? All kind of stuff. Like So there's a lot of the overwhelming data. There are, you know, like, especially we're catching a lot more um, time bound data, right? Like transaction histories you know, customer interactions, you know, even if the if, if we want to get the behavior of where they are, there's a lot of just tr tracking data that we're collecting. So how do we make it useful and how do we store them? Like that's a lot of um, things that they have. And lastly, but last but not least, the data pipeline chaos, right? And it's because we have all these um, needs and challenges, right? So we're creating a lot of um, data pipelines to kind of make sure that the data flows and, and to, get, to get them to one point to the other. And a lot of the data pipelines were just built on top of, you know, somebody's uh, laptop. And then, you know, if that, that, that person is gone, that's gone, right? So I've seen that doing a lot, especially with the marketing team where they have like one single Google sheet to kind of maintain a, as a data store. And I see that happens a lot internally as well. So I, I just want to take a step back, right? Because um, I do a lot of integration and, and data thing like so let's take a step back of like what they are I think you already seen this but I just want to re-emphasize this right so what types of data do we have right so we either have 
a batch pipeline. So they're typically dealing with like larger sizes and their, their nature, the nature of this type of batch is um, used for a, uh, for more of a legacy protocols or legacy systems like file transfers, right? Running inside a database to get a lot of things, relational database to get things right. So they are more vertical scaling. It's really, some of them does horizontal scaling, but most of them were kind of vertical bound. So in order to kind of increase the capacity, you need to kind of increase the capacity of your hardware. So that's what they are. And uh, they, they, they tend to have a longer latency, right? Um, and then like when you, where you see them, you kind of see them in the data warehouse and data, database. Um, and that's when they, that's kind of where they resize. And the things that they're running out, it's either a batch, it's, it's either a batch services, like you just write batch and just move everything, or you can do like that reduce on top of your Hadoop data stores and all that. Right. So that's kind of what batch is about. Um, and then we also have micro batch i think that's kind of a middle ground where we when, when we don't have anything that we can process quicker there's something that we can do for most of the bi or you know business intelligence reports this is where i see the word mostly used um so they are smaller in size they have uh, because we want a, a much more recent report right they can't they can't be like uh, two or three days late that's not going to be useful so we have a defined chunk of um, data sizes and just because of the scalability and all that, so we want to make sure that we're isolating a particular chunk of data and run them frequently. Um, and then, you know, having some kind of like temp storages to kind of store historical stuff um, and to run that and then and, and then tend to scale a lot better with the horizontal scales. So you can have, a, you can generate um, reports, generate a data sets for this type of, um, for for getting your data out, of it, out there as well. But I think what I've, been seeing more recently is the use of real-time data, right? I think um, people are using a lot more real-time. They want real-time decisions. They want a real-time feedback. That's why people are using a lot of the streaming platform, using reuse the stream platform to provide them like real quick, direct feedback on those pipelines. So working with pipelines, the problem that's that's good because we have all this pipeline, right? That's all here. But the problem that I I when I ask people like, what is your biggest problem when working with pipelines? Um, I think the the biggest one that I ask when I ask around is the difficulty of accessing data, um, because uh, the data that we're getting today are not as structured as we would like it to be. It could be image, it could be, it could be a video, it could be um a different structure of data. It could be a JSON. It could be um just a csv file or whatever that is coming from right it's it's just different data structures right so the lack of metadata making it really hard for us to kind of locate our desire uh, like the, the desired data that we want to get from right from the, the repository and a lot of the analytics tools um our platforms are pretty strict regarding to the data format so it's really hard for them to actually use reuse the data that was provided into the required format. So therefore you gotta create more um, complex data pipelines in order to kind of transform the data into something that they like. So it's not like an easy single step of, okay, um, I need to get that. Or sometimes it's more like, okay, so I know what the data is and I can get it out. But the problem is the security measures or regular reg regulations, compl compliances, that can introduce a lot of um, middle ground that people can where how they can access the data. So that's one thing that people find difficult when they were trying to access data. Another one is the noisy data. I think nobody can get away from that, especially with the data lake or should I call it data swamp. Um, you know, like people were kind of finding there's a lot of duplication of data because people just keep throwing data into data lake, you know. You know, this is this is a great store. It's cheap. You can just put everything in there, but they're not not very well organized. So it kind of just becomes this huge glue of things where we're trying when we're trying to pick things up. It's really hard to find it. It's really hard to use them, and it takes time, right? So and also the data, the relevance of data, right? So some of the data are outdated, and why is it still in there? Why is it still in my uh, in my in my uh, 
transactional database? Why is it still in there? And why is it, oh, should I should I be cleaning them out? Or should I kind of, should, should I, if they're outdated, should I delete them? Or should I just kind of archive them? Um, or or the, another one that is really common with the noisy data is data mismatch, right? So they're just garbage in, garbage out. So garbage goes in there and that was not relevant. It's really hard to map who they are. Sometimes, you know, some person's working from this company and they they have the same name, but the company changed name. So there's a lot of things that's causing the data to be very noisy. So you got to find a way to kind of make sure that it's clean, that regular things to do. And and also because of that, the performance and, and we're getting, a, because we're getting a lot more data um, nowadays comparing to where we are before, um, just the sheer volume of data, it makes processing a lot, a lot, processing a lot difficult, right? There's a lot of performance um, problems. Do I have enough time frame to run my batch? Um, do I have enough CPU powers to calculate, to process what I want, right? Um, and the method of retrieving data is also the problem, right? Because if I'm trying to retrieve data through API endpoint, that means I have to make multiple API calls. Sometimes, depending on how they design the interface, it takes a lot of time to actually get what you want. Um, so you kind of, and also where the where the data is stored, the location of it is making the performance. It's it's going to sacrifice your performances. Another one is data visibilities. They have no visibilities into. Uh, what the data, where data are, they don't know the metadata, they don't know um, if even if it exists just because of the data silo, right? They don't know, hey, this data exists like um, maybe 10 years ago when we designed the system, right? They don't know that. And there's no well documentations or there's no metadata shared across different places. And that's why people find it's really hard to just fly in the blind and find things. Another one that people face, I see, is troubleshooting, right? Like it's really hard to um kind of find out what's going on when you're facing with noisy data when you're having performances problem when you don't have visibility into things it's, i think it's all contribute to it's really hard to um fix things because you don't just don't have good data qualities so these are the things that i see that works today right so and one of the uh, one of the most asked questions for me recently because of the ai craze um, everybody was asking like, oh, so how do we prep ourselves into this AI world? Well, it's like, if you take a look at AI, it's not like magic, right? AI is something that you need to, you need your machine to learn in order to get, to get your machine learning the, um, the logic that is supposed to apply, you need to, you need to actually create data sets. And that's the machine learning part of the of of the work, right? And I think that's that mostly plays with with the data architecture. So how do we get to the point where we're providing data sets? Oops, providing data sets to do to to kind of start generating models, to do model trainings, to do model predictions, and then it will generate the mod the model registries, and then we'll use the same data, similar data or different data to kind of become the reference data. And when there's actual uh, events coming into the system, it will use that data model that we have used to, we, we just generate that, the model that we just generate using the data set that we provide to kind of apply that into the system, which is the inference part of the AI. Um, the AI, AI structure where you can use the reference data plus the data model to make like real-time decisions or you know, artificial intelligence decisions for your users. Right, so that's kind of where things are. So if you look at it, um, what we need to do from the data architecture part is probably just getting the data sets right. Um, so that's why I was thinking, thinking like using the um, kind of the things I've seen, like different methodologies that people has been adopting. Um, I was, I was, I really like the way that you know they started talking about like data mesh and stuff like that. I think it's a really good way of doing it. The problem with that for me is it's it's really there's a lot of um methodologies and there's a lot of concepts and there's a lot of things you need to you, you need to take in and like have that concerns and to get it adopted. So I would say, you know, it's good to it's good to be there, it's good to kind of become that mesh, right? But how do we get to that mesh? Um I want to focus this on more on the more practical side, like more on the um the infrastructure side or like how do we do that for for your data and i think 
this is a way to get you to that. So the first way is to build an infrastructure highway for your data, right? And like what every good book would say about, you know, building your own, re re redesigning your data architecture is make sure that you are working with a smaller set of domains. It is never be cool and it will take forever for you to get everybody coordinated inside your company to start working on that project. So it's always good to have a isolated, you know, domain so you can start working with that and slowly spread your work across and expand that to the entire company, but always start with a single domain. Um, and then you start your data modeling work. I won't dive into the data modeling um, today because, you know, to be honest with you, I have yet to find the best way to model my data. I've tried Kimball, I've tried Iman, but I can never, with those two methods, I can never satisfy anybody, everybody. Um, there's always people complaining. I just, like, I have to always like change models and stuff like that. So this is a call for you. Um, if you know a better method of doing a data model, I love to chat with you. Uh, you know, I would love to share. That's that's you know, compare notes. We can see like what's the best way. So I can do another talk next time about data modeling. But for me, um, I think a a good data modeling it is it will be a good foundation. But once you get that first initial, but I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. You should still do it. Try to do it. You know, make everybody happy, but you should still do it. But provide a data access endpoint. Um, for people to start retrieving your data, they need to know what they're getting, right? So data model access points, and then also federated governance, right? Governance should be part of your plan on getting that done, but I'm not going to talk about it just because it's just too many communication skills and politics around that. So we'll be focusing more on the self-services data streaming infrastructure, right? So that's where I think uh, we where we should focus on and how we should do our things, right? So this is my my way of thinking, right? So in order to get the data flowing, we need to kind of create a a a streaming highway, basically. So instead of asking for data, everything should be push based. Well, not everything should be push based. Everything would ideally be push based. Um, if something happens, um, it will be pushed through the networks of your data, and that will get processed uh, in uh, in into its ideal state. For instance, if you have like three different systems, they require different three different formats. Then you will push that data into that, and then quickly convert convert the data into their ideal format, and then push back push that into the system they're trying to ingest, right? There's always going to be a request coming in for pulling the data, but that's another story. That's the endpoint that you're providing. That is the endpoint that you're providing here, right? Right here on the, uh, it's really hard to use this data pack, that you're using here on the, on the, um, on the right where you can use it to access your data, but mostly I think data inside your system should be like, should be like, you know, human blood where it's just going to traverse through your entire system flowing through when things come in and then things get triggered and they get processed. So data will be flowing in and out um, through this uh, streaming streaming pipelines or streaming process that's set between different um, connection points or different services and they get, they get uh, turned or different data ingestion points and then they get received and then they process it and then put, they put it somewhere or trigger another one, which is going to make things a lot better uh, in terms of um, the data data pipelines. I'll show you a little bit later on why, why I say that. Of course, I'm not going to deny that, you know, there's going to be, you know, always a need for batch pipelines. I'm not telling you not to do them, even when you have streaming data, because there's always a need for different types of data, like streaming, like video video content. I don't think you can do that through streaming very well, right? So I will still do those, those in pipelines. Some of the longer BI, you know, business reports that these historical data, I think some of them still requires micro batching. So I, there's just different types of different pipelines they deserve to in a, in, a, in a different places, but most of the data inside your company, inside everything should be pre-prepared, pre even for the BI ones. They ideally, they want, I want, 
we want them to be somewhere that is in the most ready place. So when you're trying to query them, when you're trying to pull them, when you're trying to aggregate them, they're all in a much, much better form in order to get it out as well. So we'll, what we see is we'll have data warehouse um, in, in the middle, uh, in the at the end where it's, it's, tr it's trying to store a more structured data, uh, more structured data and data like, like is kind of just where everything was temporarily stored and real time engine for you to pull in data or, or transactional database for transactional, quick transactional um, application where they don't really like to integrate with um, other other things. But, you know, like any transaction that happens in the trans transactional database should then be signal into your data, data highway that letting people know that, hey, your data is being changed and here are, here's the signal, who wants it? And then people will pick it up and they'll put it in there as well. So that's kind of like what I, my view of what the data infrastructure of how you should set it up. So basically having a interconnect point for everything. So a quick look into um, uh, what is in that data, uh, data highway or data kind of, we call it data mesh or data highway, stuff like that is um, so you can have multiple uh, streaming platform. Well, you can have streaming platform with multiple clusters forming a forming a mesh or the network for the data to go in and out of that. And each one of the, what each, each one of the logical representation, we call them topics, they can be um, set into different model names. So you, if you ever want transaction data, you can get it from a particular topics where you can kind of receive from, receive from different topics. If you ever want to hear a difference between uh, the, uh, the latest transaction uh, inter interest rates or whatever, whatever, whatever that is, you can receive it from there. So just a quick, uh, just quick shameless, shameless plug on the streaming platform. So we Red Panda is a great streaming platform to kind of do that. I think our, our we are a direct replacement for Kafka. So basically you can use us to um, to stream data in and out of your system to build that highway, of course. Um, our biggest difference between us and Kafka is that we actually, we, 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 we actually optimize your hardware, right? So instead of you know relying on JVMs and then page cache and then disks, we we just avoid all that management all altogether. Also, we we use our Threadpick core architecture where we can quickly um, write our you know, stream more data in and out of uh, the broker as quick as possible. And we also have a lot of add-on stuff like you know, uh, automatic. Uh, partition uh, balancers as well. So we can automatically balance your brokers because everything, if it's, if your brokers are in balance, it could take, you know, it could take a while for it to kind of, it could jeopardize your streaming uh, highway. So everything can be like really jammed up or there can be troubleshooting issues as well. And then we also do a lot of like RPK toolings like my fav my personal favorite is the RPK tooling because it makes me easy to kind of have, uh, to create the applications. So that's that. Do think about us when you want to build your um, highway. But what is that little dot right in like do on on top of the highway? So I call them the um I think I got these ideas from a lot of times when I was doing integration as well. Is that they there's the these joint points were a little pipelines or data pipelines that you can create in order to process the data, the, the streaming data comes in and out of that. And then they do a lot of things. And I, I heard people doing a lot of like patterns. Uh, I, there's a lot of million, there's millions of talks that I go to that talks about different patterns, but we've been doing that for a very long time in the, uh, in our camel community it's called enterprise integration patterns if you haven't heard of that i would strongly recommend you to kind of read that book it because we've been doing those kind of things for a long time um the idea doesn't change but the way that things can implement can be a little bit different but basically what you're doing is you're either doing transformations or you're doing enrichment or you're doing some kind of rerouting of your data uh, from one point to the other so that's kind of where the the thoughts are and um so when I was saying there's the chaotic pipeline thing that was going on, I think what we can do is to organize them a little bit better. And we, the way that I categorize them with like batch, micro batch, and then real time, we can also kind of split them up and more having them more in the detail of 
what each of them do, right? So we can we can start with the most used one. So this is what I see that people will use more often is the stateless streaming pipelines, right? So these are the pipelines that, that is going to handle a lot of the traffics when there's data coming in, there's when there's initial data coming in, when there's things, you gotta do some kind of reformatting, normalizing, you know, um, transformations, filtering, validations. Validation is one of the things that you probably want to do in order to make sure your data is clean, right? All this type of things that you can do that you do like mostly, and it, these type of pipelines does not need to remember any of the historical things that has happened. Anything comes in, it just look at it and quickly process it and just let it go or store it or send it somewhere else, right? So these type of pipelines shouldn't take you that long to kind of create and it should be easy to scale out because just because of the nature of they don't remember anything. So these should be very easy to horizontally scale out. And then you get stateful pipeline. This gets a little bit tricky because this uh we call we used to use them as like complex event processing or time window based based processing where it will need to remember some of the states, um, and that causes um, complexity because of you know if something goes wrong, then I still need to remember the state or where it kind of last went off. I still need to pick it up, right? So this type of um, pipeline is a little bit. They're, they're a little bit less that you you don't see them that often but you, you still see them um then you still have to kind of take care of them so these are the second level pipeline that you see you'll see more of them and then on top of that you see you, you're starting to see more of the large data volume data processing where you see like you know micro batching where you want to do a lot of analytics based on a huge set of data as well so these these type of things you know some there's there's a smart way of doing it, like storing it in a time, uh, like time series database or things like that to make it easier for people to kind of process depending on what they are. And also you have the uh, the batch pipeline where you, that's like, it's it's the it's the most traditional ways of like, sometimes they're just still in files or you need to get them into the data sets, all that kind of stuff. So you still need that batch pipelines. So these are the hierarchies of pipelines that you see in, in, in the, um, in, in the entire in the entire system, right? And this is just a sorry about the drawing, why it's like squiggle, but I'm just trying to um, kind of showcase, you know, where where the um the the state of where the pipeline starts, right? So when the ingestion comes in, it will goes into your highway, and then that's when your streaming pipeline kicks in. So first of all, this the stateless pipeline comes in, and they will start dis dispatching, they will start transforming, they'll do like quick stuff. And because there's a lot of them, because it's easy to scale them, they'll quickly process it into the right place. And then the the um the stateful pipeline kicks in, right? Because you know once they they um that satisfy their requirement of processing, they will start processing it depending on their time window base or you know the certain requirement that was met that triggers that pipeline to start or to start processing, all that kind of stuff. This is the stateful thing, and they will start receiving that and putting that back into the into the highway. And once everything gets um gets into the highway, there is some micro batch processing that you probably want to do. Um, that that first still get the uh, continuous feed of the new data plus the historical data that you already have in your 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 um, data stores no matter where they are and then the batch pipelines were that you know that gets stored or that gets processed at night that just needs to be done like in the large file sets right so and i i think i'm going with that because that kind of determines where where Red Panda is going in the future and where we how I see things are going with all this data pipelines and how do we make it easier for data engineers to get their things out, right? So what we're seeing is there is a lot of, um, there's going to be a lot of stateless streaming pipelines going in and out. And the way that we currently do that is to kind of store them somewhere or re receiving that from a streaming service, stream, streaming places. And then, you know, just receiving that, consuming that from a streaming platform, load it into the into my computer system, load it into CPUs, load it into memories, 
process it and then put it back into the streaming services. There's a lot of like data ping pong going in and out, in and out the traffic, right? So you've got ingress, egress traffic, you've got memory loadings and you've got CPU processing and sending it back. So there's a lot of waste of energies. So what we think, what we think will be happening a lot later on uh, in, the, in the data, um, engineering world is that people are got, will, will start thinking about, you know, is it a, a better, more efficient way of, you know, processing the stateless um, pipelines? If if I if everything just happens in the in the streaming broker level or the streaming platform level, um, can we just inject a Watson or you know not Watson? We we choose Watson because we like it to be more ad, ad language agnostic. So you can choose whatever languages that you want to use. But everything can be processed, transformed, filtered, validated inside your um, inside your system. Um, so, so that's what we're trying to do, like in the Red Panda space. So, I think in the future, what you can do is you can start putting your uh, applying your stateless transform logic or transform pipeline logics into the broker. So the broker will directly do that internally when it's when the data hits. Our, uh hits the broker CPUs or hits the broker memories or where we are and we'll start to transform it and then it will do a quick move over or replication of the same thing plus the transformations into the same broker and that could be quite quickly accessed. So there's no extra work or extra flow that needs to be done for uh for these type of transactions. Another one that I that we think that we I've seen at least like at least you can see all the new investment um, that was going into the industry lately that everybody was going to a standardized tool of accessing data. And that was more like a SQL base. So you can see a lot of the things were happening. Like um, like Flink was all over the place, right? If I open up, if if we start a Flink course today, we're going to have, have a lot of people because people wanted to learn about Flink, use SQL to retrieve data. So I think SQL is not going away. And there's going to be like a standardized um, people are, it's going to be more, much more standardized and there's a lot of technology out there that's going to allow you to use to use that tool to access data and data can come from different places and they need only to be um, uh, enabled and being accessed by this interface. But another thing that we also see is the efficient use of cloud storage. Um, so you know now that we have built this um, in, like infrastructure highway, right? So with this infrastructure highway, um, how do we, you know, not most often with this thing, we'll probably offload the use data into a data store, say a S3 object stores, right? These are all on the cloud. Um, but the problem is every single time when we're trying to offload this data or process this data, you need to do a lot of um, transformations or transfers and, you know, normalizations in order to get the data access. What happens if there's a way that way we can reuse the stream data. So when the data comes in and out of your streaming highway, everything gets stored somewhere. If we can reuse that cheap object data store using your SQL interface um, to access that, there's no need for you to kind of export it, you know, put it somewhere else. If we can reuse that as the center of your data store, wouldn't that be better, right? So Another things that in Red Panda we're trying to do is we're trying to be uh, we're trying to work with Apache Iceberg to provide you with that experiences. So once you have the data um, highway um, created, what we're gonna do is everything that hits into your um, disk if it's if it's if you need to move it to outside store we currently already do it with tier storage where we can move the data over to the S three um, buckets. And then you can have um, or any other object stores on the net, and then you can kind of use the um, iceberg on top of it to do the um, to do the metadata and to do access uh, for your historical data, and that's kind of where we're going. And I think with this, it's going to solve you a lot of problem, right? First of all, um, I forgot to mention that when you're creating the highways, um, you when you're creating highways, you want to make sure that you also set up your schemas, right? Schema registry is one of the things that, you know, that we all do. Hopefully you don't forget about it, right? Schema registry so people know where they are. So it, it solves the data, the data not transparent problems. And then you also have, because all the data are flowing in and out, the, in and out of, of your system and it's easier to access them through the highway. So we're not, we're breaking that silo, right? Hopefully we can break in that silos. 
and you know it's it's because we're injecting that data validations um, with those stateless quick data transformation data pipelines um, either internally in your broker or externally so we're hoping that this will then clean up your data so it's a lot cleaner and because of the way that we handle horizontal with uh, streaming traffics it's easier to um, scale them out so we can uh, certainly adopt a lot more traffics so that's going to solve our performances problem so that's kind of why I was preaching this idea of like building this data highway for your um for your data pipelines and also adding that different differentiate different data pipeline natures to make them easier to access and it's easier to scale them out it's easier to it's even easier to manage them and all that so that's kind of my talk for today so thank you very much and um here if you want to learn more about red panda and what we think there's a lot of um there's a lot of uh, documentations and learning resource and i'm always there in the slack community if you want to hear more about me or you can if you want to give me feedback on especially the data modeling part let me know um let me know ping me on slack i'm always there um and i think we can go ahead and start the q a let me see. Right. I don't think there's any Q&A. So is there anything else that we need to do? I guess we can probably end the session early, right? If that's the case, Thank you very much. And I would like to hear more of your feedback. Oh, okay. There's a there's a question coming in. Okay. This is from Derek. Thanks, Christina. That was very informative. I'm still in a beginner. Project. So uh, learning towards. Yeah, this is a bit long. Derek, can I, can I, can I, um, maybe we can talk about this offline. This is a bit long. I still need to read it. This, like, the, the interface is not that easy to read. Um, should, can, can I meet you over there in the, uh, the Slack community, if it's okay with you? Or can you email me? I, I have an email, Christina at repanda.com. We can kind of, uh, go do that there. So, um, thank you very much. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you all. Hi, Christina. It looks like we got one more question in. I don't know if you want to take a look at that. Oh, okay. Sorry. The, this interface is That's, not that. Yeah, it's a little, it's a little uh, tough to uh, see sometimes. Um, from Thomas. Um, I can read it out to you if you'd like. Um, it says, can you share your thought about data affinity? Moving data to processing is expensive compared to moving processing to data. I, I I think that's a good question actually. That's why I preach for um that's why I kind of preach for moving data. Sorry, this is this thing is moving. Um That's why we preach for the Wasm um uh, kind of the awesome uh, approach of doing things, right? Because like what you said, moving data to processing is expensive, right? So when you have unstructured data, moving it over to processing, instead, we should always do our data move uh, to kind of create or process our data um, right away, like right? inside the broker or as quickly as we can, and then to have them ready and broadcast them out. So I think I do... I do think that's why we're that's what we're trying to do for Red Panda as well. So I kind of, I don't know how that answers your question, but I, that's kind of my way of thinking about it. Maybe I need to give it a better thought about this. Um, but yeah, we can probably do this um a little bit later. But yes, I I think you're right. My my thought is you know just you should always 
pre-process your data before it gets to destination as 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 much as much as you want as as much as you can. Hope that answers your question, Thomas. All right. Awesome. It looks like that was the last one. So thank you, Christina, for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.